There are many other kinds of microscopy out there, but we've covered the basics. I'm going to tell you about another technique used by cell biologists to study cell structure and function. This is called cell fractionation. Just like fractions are part of a whole, fractionation relies on taking the components of a cell apart and examining those parts in isolation. A device called a centrifuge is used to exaggerate the force of gravity and separate the different organelles out by weight. Here's how it works. Let's start with a vial of cultured cells. Those cultured cells can then be put in a homogenizer, which bears a striking resemblance to a kitchen blender. That is essentially what it is. The homogenizer makes a cell smoothie, breaking all the membranes of the cells apart. The result is this homogenate, which kind of looks like a party in a test tube. The homogenate is then put into a centrifuge, which spins the homogenate around to separate the parts. The spinning of the centrifuge exaggerates the force of gravity. The first round is fairly brief, only 10 minutes and at 1,000 times the force of gravity, or 1,000 g. This separates out the largest cell parts in the bottom of the test tube, where they form a solid nub called the pellet. This first pellet has the cell nuclei as well as other large cell debris in it. The liquid phase still has a lot of cell parts swimming in it, and it's called the supernatant, which literally means swimming above. The supernatant is then transferred to another tube, where it is spun at 20,000 G for 20 minutes. Each step spins faster and takes more time. The second spin pellets out the mitochondria and chloroplast, also if it's a plant tissue sample. Another round of spinning, the supernatant pellets out tiny particles called microsomes. And then one final round produces a pellet with those protein factories called the ribosomes. The times and speeds aren't important. What is important is that each round is faster and longer, and each round pellets out smaller cell parts. Now that I've told you about some techniques, I can tell you about what we know about different types of cells. Most broadly, we can break it down to two basic types, prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Before I tell you how they are different, here's how they are the same. All cells have these four features in common. They have a phospholipid bilayer forming a boundary between the outside and the inside of the cell called the plasma membrane. Inside the plasma membrane is a watery solution with lots of biological macromolecules dissolved in it called the cytosol, which means cell solution. Every cell has DNA in it to carry the instructions for how to run the cell and how to replicate the cell. The DNA molecule or molecules are called chromosomes. And lastly, every cell has ribosomes to make protein from the messenger RNAs encoded in the chromosomes. Again, every cell has these four features. And note how easy it would be for me to just slap some letters in front of this list of four to make a multiple choice question on a quiz or exam. Wink. Prokaryotic cells are what we find in two domains of the three domains of life the bacteria, and the archaea. Prokaryote, and this is very important, is a descriptive term, not a taxonomic one. For more details, you'll have to wait for organismal biology or microbiology. Prokaryotic organisms are single-celled or colonial, but never truly multicellular. In previous biology classes, you probably learned that prokaryotes are cells without nuclei, and that is true, but a more accurate statement would be that prokaryotes are cells without any membrane-bound organelles, including nuclei, just a plasma membrane. The chromosomes of prokaryotic cells are in the cytoplasm, and usually neatly crumpled up in a region called the nucleoid, which means it looks kind of like a nucleus, because we're eukaryotes and that's the lens we view the world through. But the nucleoid is just out in the cytoplasm with the ribosomes, and that's an important distinction from eukaryotic cells that will be very prominent, wink, when we talk about gene expression in chapter 17. Let's look at a generic prokaryotic cell. 
For all of these generic cells, you are unlikely to see something like them in nature because the artist is trying to showcase the diverse features in a single drawing. Fimbriae are short strands of protein that some bacteria have that enable them to attach to each other and to surfaces. And by surfaces, I mean like the surface of your nasal passages and throat. If you're a disease-causing or pathogenic bacterium, you need to stay in contact with your host, and fimbriae help to attach. Here, I say, will say for the first time, fimbriae are not cilia. Nucleoid is the term used to describe the dense mass of DNA found in prokaryotic cells. It can occupy a large percentage of cytoplasmic real estate and can move around the cytoplasm freely. Ribosomes are where polypeptides are made. Ribosomes of prokaryotic cells are similar to ribosomes of eukaryotic cells in structure and function. I'll tell you more about this in a few slides. The size of bacterial and archaeal ribosomes is a little bit different from eukaryotic ribosomes, and this is very important, wink, in the treatment of diseases caused by bacteria. The plasma membrane, another of the universal features of cellular life, is a phospholipid bilayer that surrounds the cytoplasm and manages the movement of material into and out of the cell. We have a whole chapter on membranes coming up, so let's put a pin in that for now. The cell wall of prokaryotic cells is made of... Uh, not the one kind of cell stuff we talked about, and not the other kind of cell wall stuff we talked about, but a third kind of cell wall stuff. First of all, do you remember the other two cell wall stuffs and which organisms make them? Plants have cell walls made out of cellulose, and fungi have a cell wall made out of chitin. Bacteria have cell walls made out of a third polymer called peptidoglycan. Can you guess what kind of molecules make peptidoglycan? If peptido makes you think protein and glycan makes you think of sugary carbohydrates, then congratulations, you are correct. And the fact that peptidoglycan is exclusively a bacterial polymer makes it another target for treatment of bacterial disease. Archaea have a slightly different polymer in their cell walls called pseudopeptidoglycan. How imaginative is that? Not very, but fortunately fairly easy, easy for us to remember. Hopefully. Moving on to the capsule. The capsule is another structure that helps pathogenic bacteria stick to the insides of their host. It's made up of a gooey, gluey polysaccharide, kind of like mucus. In chapter 16, the ability to form a capsule is a key to life or death for little mice in experiments conducted by Dr. Griffith. So another mental pen in that. This picture shows a bacterium with three flagella, though there may be only one flagellum or several. We will see flagella in eukaryotic cells also, and in all cases the flagella are used for locomotion. Flagella whip around like the motor on a speedboat to propel prokaryotic cells toward a stimulus. Very important. Prokaryotic flagella and eukaryotic flagella have similar function, but very different structure. A bacterial flagellum has a solid protein shaft and a motor protein driver that spins it. We'll see how a eukaryotic flagellum is, is different later in this chapter in part two. Finally, we have the bacterial chromosome, which is the loop of DNA that encodes all of the necessary information for the cell to divide and reproduce. Leaving prokaryotic cells behind, we transition to eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are what everything else that is in a bacterium or archaeon are. For most people, that's everything. All multicellular life is eukaryotic and there's plenty of eukaryotic life that is unicellular or colonial. The feature that distinguishes eukaryotic cells from prokaryotic cells is membrane-bound organelles, including a nucleus, which is the home of the chromosomes. Between the nucleus and the plasma membrane is the cytoplasm. Towards the end of this chapter, we'll learn about the cytoskeleton, which is only found in eukaryotes. 
and most of the time eukaryotic cells are much larger than prokaryotic cells, as we saw in the scale earlier in this lecture. So it's all about the membrane-bound organelles, including the nucleus. All cells have a plasma membrane, which is the boundary between the inside and outside of the cell, which is made of a phospholipid bilayer studded with proteins. In eukaryotes, there are a lot more membranes to be found. Membrane-bound organelles can separate out certain tasks. Remember, membranes function like walls or barriers, so the membranes can make discrete compartments inside a cell. Just like a house that has walls on the inside can separate the kitchen from bedrooms, from the bathrooms, and all the other rooms. This means several different tasks can be completed at the same time. But we have all of Chapter 7 to talk about membranes. In this slide, we see a transmission electron micrograph, or TEM, of a plasma membrane, and an illustration. Here we see the phospholipid bilayer as the gray eggs with the yellow legs. The hydrophobic fatty acids cluster together away from the watery cytoplasm and external environment, and the phosphate groups face outward. There are proteins, which are the purple blobs that act like the doors and windows and other hardware for the barrier, which is the bilayer. We'll see this again in chapter seven, a whole chapter just for membranes. Are you excited? Force that enthusiasm. We're gonna dedicate most of our attention to looking at plant and animal cells as representatives of the eukaryotes. These two kingdoms share most of the same organelles with a few exceptions that I will point out. Here we see a generalized animal cell. Similar to the bacterial cart cell cartoon that you saw, you won't find a cell quite like this under any microscope. I'm not gonna lecture on each of these components right now. I've got lots of other slides to show you. Do you notice how there are a lot of new organelles we didn't see in the bacterial cell? So the generalized cell shows us quite colorfully how one cell can look when it looks like no particular cell. But also impressive to me is how one cell, the fusion of sperm and egg to form a zygote, like you see here, can divide and differentiate into hundreds of different types of cells in a single individual. Here is just a sampling of those hundreds of kinds of cells, which you can see have different structure to match their different functions. Memorize these? No, not for this class. Some other class, maybe. Probably but these are not eminently important for us. Wink. Let's take a look now at a generalized plant cell. If you go back and look at the animal cell, you'll notice again a lot of the same parts. I will draw your attention to a couple of important differences and an important similarity. Differences. The plant cell has chloroplast, these green things here that are the real powerhouse of the cell. More on that later here, and then all of chapter 10 in this unit. Also, as you know, a cell wall, which is made out of cellulose. And this big, apparently empty space in the middle, which is not really empty, but a useful storage vessel called a central vacuole. Important similarity. Plants have mitochondria. Some folks miss that part, so let me say it again. Plants have mitochondria, as do animals and almost all eukaryotes. Just as we saw in animals, plants are also multicellular and differentiate from a zygote into different cell types. Not hundreds of different cell types like animals, but a few. Plants have tissue systems and organs like stems, leaves, and roots, and these are comprised of differentiated cell types that come from a first single cell. In addition to plants and animals, there are other types of eukaryotic cells that merit at least a passing mention. In this slide, we can see some epithelial cells from a human uterus, which have been colorized in this TEM image. And on the right here, we see a fungal cell, a cell of a yeast. Note that many structures are similar and similarly colored. The cytoplasm in tan and the nucleus in purple. Fungal cells may also have vacuoles, like plant cells, and for a similar reason that I'll get into later. But it has something to do with the bit outside of the plasma membrane, 
which is the fungal cell wall. Like a plant cell wall? Yes, but also no, because you know that the fungal cell wall is made out of chitin. In addition to plants, animals, and fungi, there are many, many eukaryotes that fall under the umbrella of protists. If you go on to take Biology 1030, Organismal Biology, you will find that there is a lot of diversity out there to explore. Here's just one example of a basal eukaryote, or protist, which is a green alga called Chlamydomonas. Isn't that a fun word to say? It is. Chlamydomonas. Green algae are very like plants with their chloroplasts and cellulose cell walls. However, green algae may also be single-celled, which we never find in plants, and flagellated, which is something we rarely find in plants. This colorized TEM over here of Chlamydomonas reminds me of someone. Do you see it? Ah, there it is. Not a coincidence, of course. The late Stephen Hillenberg, the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants, was a marine biologist before he went into cartooning. 